Good morning, everybody. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Lyriad Meteor Shower, which um, starts tonight in Australia, it's about the 16th, um, and goes through to around the 25th, to the end of the month, around the 30th, and the peak will be around the 22nd, 23rd overnight. But you'll be able to see meteors if you have a nice, clear, dark sky, um, wherever you are. So that's what we're going to talk about. That's me, Donna the Astronomer, and let's go talk about what meteor showers actually are to start with. Okay, so this is a picture of a meteor shower. This is of Creative Commons um, because I don't have any really good ones of my own and showing how you photograph them. And the best way to photograph them is using time lapse and setting your camera up in a nice good spot and just letting it collect the information that I'll talk about photographing in another video. But so what is a meteor shower? So basically any dark, anytime you have a dark sky and no moon to impact you, you can go out and you will see what we call sporadic meteors. You'll see them almost in the sky almost any night. And um, so it's always a good idea if you're out at night, um, look up, don't do what I do, look up and then forget to look where I'm going as well and fall, up, fall head over. But always look up if you're out at night because you never know what you're going to see. Sometimes you can just be driving along and you'll see a fireball or um, um, a decent meteor. I mean, ironically, there's about 100 million meteors or more streak across the sky each day. We call them shooting stars or falling stars um, is what people generally look at them at. But most of them are about the size of a grain of sand or a seed. And they're traveling very fast, about 50 times the speed of a bullet. And we don't see most of them because a lot happened during our daylight and most burn up in the atmosphere and they leave a fine dust behind them which slowly descends to the earth. And if you sort of put all this together and the actual meteorites um, which actually land, then that would add millions of tons to the earth each year. So you have like meteoroids which are what they are when they're up there still before they actually hit our atmosphere. They became, become meteors when we see them burning up and they become meteorites when they actually land. So that's the differentiation between the, th the three of them. So meteor showers occur when the Earth passes through a trail of comet or occasionally even asteroid debris, less commonly asteroid, mainly through comets. And as you know, comets have tails of dust and ice and bits and pieces. And as they travel around the sun, they leave some of this debris or litter um, wherever they are. And every year, our Earth travels around the sun and it does it in a pretty standard way. So we can basically predict when some of these showers are, when, when we're going to pass through some of this debris and we can predict what we call meteor showers. And that's the same with the Lyrids. Um, we know that it always happens at this time of year and we know when the peak's going to be because we know where the Earth's going to be, we know where the dust is. Um, we can't always predict how good they're going to be though. And that's why it's always good to go out and have a look. So basically, um, they're named after the constellations that the meteors appear to come from, appear to appear. That's really clever even for me, Donna, but appear to come from in the night sky. So the Earth passes through about a tonne of space rock on its orbit around the sun every April. And this is what we call the Lyrid meteor shower. And it's named Lyrids because it appears to come from the constellation of Lyra. And we'll see what that is um, later on in the presentation. And there are several meteor showers that occur each year. Some of the more famous ones um, are Southern Hemisphere, the Leonids or the Geminids, which are later in the year. But um, almost every month there is a meteor shower. Um, and some are better than others. And one of the coolest things is, is you want to be able to see it when the moon isn't up. And that's a good thing about the Leonids this year, is the moon won't be rising until um, just um, well after the um, peak of it all. So this is um, a graphic that basically shows, so there you've got the Earth, the comet's orbit. You've got it going around the sun because it doesn't go around the sun in the same nice, neat um, orbit that we do. It's somewhat inclined and there's the Earth's orbit. So you can see that twice a year, um, the Earth will hit part of the comet debris. And of course, you've got um, the more famous ones like Comet Halley and the like. So 
So this is basically showing you how they hit the upper atmosphere. And you can see what they look like when you're looking at them um, up in the top picture there, when you're looking at them as a, an astronomer with your telescope images. But this is them from the space station hitting our upper atmosphere. So you can see meteor showers. And of course, meteor showers occur on other um, planets and the moon as well. And they're quite predictable because we pass through the comet's orbit each year. Okay, and when we do that, that's when it's called a meteor shower. But let's think back. What if you lived in a time where no one understood what these streaks of bright light were in the sky? Where would you think they came from? The, um, the Australian Indigenous people um, see them as spears being thrown, like a big battle happening up there in the heavens. Um, other cultures see them as similar things, and they can be quite frightening. Um, a lovely story that I learned as a young person was that after you after you die you go you get invited to Bayami's camp beyond the river and when you arrive you throw back um, a star you throw back a meteor to let people you know arrive safely but all the cultures have different stories some are nicer than others my Irish Catholic grandparents have a lot to answer for for the stories they told me but we won't go there today so where would you think they came from would you attach any meaning to their sudden appearance in the sky and that's what's important is how people saw them because when people didn't understand them they could be quite frightening now when you only see one or two it's not so bad but sometimes you can have major major meteor showers that look like the whole of the heavens are falling so how do you see them so the best way to look at them this is some tips is you'll enjoy it more if you're lying down I reckon my best solution, take out a banana lounge and, I've, and or a sun lounge or whatever you call them where you come from. Um, something to lay down, a blanket on the ground works just as well, um, as long as it's not too damp out with, with um, frost and everything. Um, but the key thing is to be laying down because you don't want to be standing looking up. You get a really sore neck doing this and if you're like me, you tend to fall over. Um, lay on the ground, put a blanket, a picnic table. My favorite would be a trampoline. Um, kids love car hoods. Um, this is something that the whole family can get involved with. It means you've got to get up early, unfortunately. But given that we're all isolating at the moment, it's a good opportunity to um, get the, get out and have a look. But you can just go meteor watching almost any night. Between that, you'll see satellites and lots of other things as well. But just find a spot, lay down, take the air guard if you're in Oz, um, and go out and have a look. So the later, the better. Um, you kind of need the, con the constellation that um, the meteor shower is coming from to be up. And in the case of Lyra, it's not ri a ri it doesn't rise until almost one o'clock in the morning. So about anywhere from four o'clock on, I'm saying five o'clock is a reasonable time because it's a bit civilised. Plus you'll also get the cool um, planet show that's going on at the moment with Mercury, Mars, Saturn and Venus. The darker the better and this since we're all locked up at the moment and I'm sorry that's a terrible way of putting it since we're in the middle of the COVID-19 um, behaving ourselves phase um, there's a lot less lights and a lot less pollution so even in the city you can see these things so go out in your backyard the longer you stay out the better it takes about 20 minutes for your eyes to adjust but plan to be out there for at least an hour it can take time, but I promise you it will pay off. If you only go out there for five or ten minutes, you'll be messaging me and saying, oh, there wasn't anything there. But go out, have a look and take some time. Okay, you don't get extra points though for being cold, hungry or thirsty or bored. So make yourself comfortable. I always like to have, um, I mean, I'm a chocolate munchie. I like my chocolate. Um, so I always have my chocolate and I have a nice warm drink. Um, you can have whatever sort of drink you like, but it's a bit of fun. Don't use anything with a screen to make yourself comfortable. Avoid using your mobile phones or your iPads. If you're going to use one of the apps on your iPad or the like, or your phone, use it with night mode on, which is a red light screen. If you're going to use a torch, put red light, red cellophane or red nail. Well, probably red cellophane is better than putting red nail polish. It's a bit hard to remove later. 
um, on so that you don't affect your night vision because it does take you about 20 minutes to adjust to to the darkness and you don't want to wreck it all just by turning on a screen so it doesn't just kill your night vision but it certainly is distracting so no equipment necessary that's the key thing you don't need a telescope you don't need binoculars probably a good idea to wear clothes but there's not much else you need except whatever you need to be comfortable with can you want to see as much of the sky as possible at once and if you're using binoculars or a telescope you can only see a very very small part of the sky so this is a nice easy one for everybody lay back and enjoy and i'm going to say this because i get into trouble quite frequently i talk about meteor showers i write about them in our local paper occasionally or on my blog or I talk about them on the local radio. Um, and then people go out for five or 10, 15, 20 minutes and they go out and they don't see anything. And so it's like, it's all my fault. Well, you can blame me, I don't mind. But don't expect to see the sky full of meteors all the time, but you will see some. And when you do, it'll be really great. Some will be um, faint, some can be quite spectacular. Really young kids under five, um, I find aren't patient enough to enjoy this unless you turn it into a game. So give them some light emitting activities like snacks or something they can play with but make it a game for them like a reward for who finds the most or who sees the most you can have a lot of fun older kids um well they'll have a lot of fun just trying to see what they can see now this is a drawing from 1888 leonard meteor shower much less predictable um, are these meteor storms and this was one amazing storm if you look at the pictures obviously i wasn't around in 1888 but I did see a, a meteor show, I think in the 80s, um, where I thought the whole sky was falling. It was for about 15 minutes or so, and there must have been thousands of um, meteors. It was a very incredible sight. And if you ever see one of these, you'll not forget it. Um, there's one account I read um, from November 1966 from Southwest USA, saying how they saw 100 meteors in a second, and it lasted most of the night. Um, I've only seen one um, report of that. At that level but certainly the nine no, um the leonards of 1966 were quite spectacular and that one was in particular the leftovers of comet temple tuttle and it was incredible we can't predict when these storms are going to happen that's why it's always worth having a look so when you look at the sky of course you might notice other things um you know you'll see your shooting stars you might see very bright um what we call fireballs and these can be quite colorful and they'll last they'll go a lot slower and stretch across the sky a lot further one of the coolest things i've seen is like you know when you skip stones on the lake you like skip it and i've seen like a meteor skip across the atmosphere and that was pretty amazing but if you're not looking you won't see them but fireballs can look green they can look white they can look yellow and sometimes they leave a trail behind them sometimes you'll notice a small moving star I and mean, this is most likely a satellite at the moment you're likely to see um, on occasion a whole lot of satellites moving with the Starlink that are up there at the moment and that'll add a bit of fun to the whole explore thing and as I said before at the moment in the early morning sky from about five o'clock onwards there are five there are four planets in the sky before five there's only three because Mercury is very low but you can see Jupiter which you can't miss it's super bright below it is yellow Saturn orange Mars and down towards the horizon big bright Mercury um, if you want to, you can download the free, the great free planetarium software called Stellarium. It works on your computer or any of your um, devices, and it doesn't matter whether it's Android or iOS. And you can see what else is there to look at when you look for meteors. And um, so meteors do hit people occasionally. A meteor becomes a meteorite when it hits the ground, but it doesn't actually hurt anybody. Um, it could hit a person or a car, they reckon, um, but there aren't a lot of many claims of it. There's two that are documented of being struck by a meteorite, but no one has actually been killed. So in here we have the 2009, a 14 year old boy was hit in the hand um, by a meteorite after seeing a flash of light. And in 1954, a grapefruit sized meteorite crashed through a roof, bounced off some furniture and landed on a sleeping woman. Now, do you count that as a hit? Um, you give the couch, but as you can see, it gave her a rather unpleasant bruise. Um, We've heard stories of them hitting over in New Zealand, um, hitting on car roofs and things like that. But you're very unlikely to be hit by one. So this is a picture from Stellarium showing the night sky 
on the morning of the 20, overnight, 22nd, 23rd. The red, the little red circle shows where the medials will basically come out from. They've got the really bright star there, which is um, the one you can pick by. You've got Vega and then over in Cygnus, you've got Deneb. Um, you can see your planets there, uh, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, um, Mars should be sitting up above there somewhere as well. It's hiding at the moment um, in that image. But what you can do, what you can see is the moon's about to rise. So you can see that you're looking towards the north. Um, the planets are rising over in the east. So that'll help you orientate yourself. You won't be able to miss Jupiter. So if you find Jupiter, just you'll be right. And um, this is a closer up picture of it. There's again, there's Vega again, and this is basically where they appear to be coming from. So they're not actually in the constellation of Lyra, but they're there. So you're looking um, between the north and the northeast. Um, any night from now on, but the peak will be on the night of the 22nd, 23rd. If you get to see some, please feel free to share with me. You can share them on my Facebook page, Milroy Kuna Barabran, or um, after this video on YouTube but enjoy, have fun and get out. Doesn't cost anything. And yes, you've got to get up early, but then maybe follow it with a nice, a lovely breakfast afterwards. Um, that's all from Donna the Astronomer signing off for today. Um, so that's the Lyriad Meteor Shower, April, 2020. Thank you for listening. And um, um, please subscribe to my channel and follow me and see what else we've got to share over the time. Thank you.